Okay, so the uh, first uh, thing that we're going to take care of today is uh, some of the um, information that's going to help you with some of the labs. So I'm going to switch to the laptop view right here, and I'm going to trigger my PowerPoint presentation that I set up uh, uh, some time ago. All right, so this has to do with the pull down and the pull up input levels and the TTL logic levels, which we already have dealt with, but this is just going to reinforce that information. And uh, something that has to do with the LEDs because you're going to, you're, you're using LEDs and the uh, input controls all the time with your labs. So this is going to give you a little bit more uh, oomph when it has to do with that. Okay, so uh, wait a second. I'm just going to get rid of my picture in picture for now. Uh, just to give you the better picture. So, uh, all right. So first thing I'm going to introduce to you is something that's called a pull down input. Okay. On the left hand here, what we have is uh, we have the VCC. And remember what that stands for? That's uh, V voltage that's come, uh, that's um, uh, that's applied to all the collectors. So when you see VCC, uh, that you know that uh, the, uh, we are probably dealing with uh, the TTL, which is transistor transistor logic. So that's where the voltage, all the collectors of the transistors are being uh, supplied from. So that's the VCC. And usually we deal with five volts. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, now we have two LEDs here. One, uh, well, let's just concentrate on this, this, uh, this one right here. I did this thing with multi-SIM. Have you guys done anything on multi-SIM at any point of the of, of, of our uh, of you being in our school? No, sir. Mm, uh, you haven't? No? Okay. Uh, demo would be great. Yeah, okay. You know what? Uh, if we have enough time today, uh, I'm going to give you a short demo on how to uh, how to use the multi-SIM. And if not, uh, I will just prepare something for you because I, I, you know what? I think that you should be able to use that multi-SIM. That, that software is all over the school. I think uh, last time I checked uh, the, all the homework labs uh, and the open lab that is right beside the soldering lab, they should all have installed the, this, the multi-SIM installed. And it's a pretty, pretty swift program. It helps you a lot uh, with, uh, with things. Actually, you know, once you start using it, you will know what I mean. All right, so uh, over here, so we have VCC, we have a LED, and we have a switch and we have a resistor, okay? So let's consider this point right here. That's where we put our um, uh, multimeter or the voltmeter on, all right? So uh, when we open the switch, obviously this point is tied to the ground. So if we measure the voltage is going to show zero volts, okay? Now when we, uh, and the LED is going to be off. All right, so when the switch is open, the LED is off, this thing is low. So when we have a pull down system connected to your inputs, it's, uh, it's very helpful visually because LED is off, that means things are low, the input is low. When the LED is on, that means the input is going to be high, all right? So uh, when we close the switch, what do we have? We have a current flow going through from here right to the ground. Remember. Uh, one thing I'm going to, uh, to, to give you a, a, an advice, whenever you're assembling, sometimes uh, you're going to, uh, to assemble uh, circuits that are more, more complicated than others on the breadboards. So here's the trick, all right? When you wanna, when you wanna get this thing more systematically and more, wanna be more comfortable, take care of the current paths first. And then, um, uh, and then after that, tap in with the parallel devices such as uh, voltmeters. Right, um, and then if you verify it, verify the same way. Verify the current paths first, and then uh, make sure that the uh, parallel devices are tapped in, such as uh, multimeters. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, over here, when you see the switch is closed, the LED is on. So there's a current flow going through the LED, going through the resistor, and going to the ground. All right, so that means the LED is on, and at this point, this thing is high. So when you have a pull down system like this, uh, the LED is off, that thing is low. Yeah. The LED is on, this point is high. So this way, it gives you a good visual 
uh, type of thing. You know uh, which pin is low, which pin is high. All right. Now, when you when you transfer that thing right onto the, uh, for example, this uh, here's an end gate. All right. So uh, this is how you how you do this. This is the pull down version. So when you close the switch, that means this uh, LED is on. Which means which one is it? This input right here is high. Okay. Now, when you uh, uh, when you open the switch on the other one, or well, the other input is this is pulled down low. The LED is off. This thing is low. So we have a high and low on the end gate, and obviously on end gate we have to have this and that in order to make the output go or activate the output. All right. So the output output is active high on the uh, on this um, uh, on this end gate here seventy four zero. Uh, 7408 okay so that's how we can uh, you know now uh, you have to have proper resistors here now what, what's going to happen here now um, uh, when you have uh, we got just just have to make sure that the, the this at this point when the led is on we have to make sure that this thing actually is high all right now i have used 330 ohm resistors and that should be pretty much enough but the better choice for that one would be maybe 470 ohm resistors when you use the red led all right uh, <clears throat> okay so uh, so that's one thing here now logic level uh input voltage is uh, 3.2 volts on this uh on this uh, thing here so 3.2 volts according to our levels um come on according to our levels 3.2 volts that falls within the high region of the input searching of the of the whatever the gate wants to see on the input okay. so that is going to be considered high okay uh, uh so that's good so the 330 ohm resistor should be enough for that one um so here's the pull down. Why is it called pull down? It's because um, uh, at the idle state, the input is pulled down. All right. When nothing has happened, the input is pulled down. Right. When you activate the switch, the input goes high. Now let's uh, consider this uh, pull up input. All right. When the switch is open on this uh, on the at this point here, switch is open. The input is this at this point here. That thing is this input is pulled high. So these are pull up resistors. Right? Now you can put the LED in here, or you can actually put the LED here. Doesn't matter. It's in series. Right? So what's going to happen now? Pull up at the pull up system. So when this system is not active, when it's sitting at its idle, the input is pulled up, All right? So this, this here is this input, and let's say this thing here is this input right here. Right. And quite often the 330 ohms resistor, there's a popular terminology says that uh, these are the pull up resistors. Uh, basically uh, when, uh, uh, when you, when you in, um, assemble the TTL, um, circuits, the chips, the ICs, integrated circuits, uh, quite often it's a common practice to install the pull-up resistors uh, at the inputs just to make sure that when nothing is connected to it, just to make sure that the input is pulled high so we know exactly where it sits. Now, sometimes uh, it's possible to do, and sometimes you have to do some tricks uh, to avoid that. Uh, it's a very rare case, but but uh, usually if you want to get something uh, when you want it, because by the specs of TTL circuitry, even if you don't connect anything to the input of the uh, resistor or the if you don't if you don't connect anything to the input of the gate and if you activate the gate by providing the power to it because it's an active device it has to be powered on so pin 14 usually if it's a 14 pin chip pin 14 goes high uh, to the vcc pin 7 goes uh, to the ground that means that the chip is turned on it's active it's an active device not a passive device right uh, so <clears throat> So then, if that is if that happens when you activate the chip, then uh, by the specifications of that uh, TTL technology, the, the, the TTL family of integrated circuits, uh, those inputs are pulled up high automatically. 
Okay. However, just to make double sure, quite often the pull-up resistors are being installed, and usually the, this would be 330 ohm resistors with the TTL family. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, in this case, I have installed the LED here. However, you can install the LED here. It's a serious thing. So, if you activate the switch, uh, the LED should be on. And when you deactivate the switch, the LED should be off. And it doesn't matter where you put the LED here or if you put the LED here. Right? So, quite often, uh, you're going to have uh, those pull up resistors right onto VCC, right onto VCC, right onto VCC. Not always you're going to want to have indicators, uh, uh, you know, because when you, when you have a complicated circuit uh, that's it's supposed to be working, not indicating that it's working, then, uh, then sometimes you skip those LEDs, right? Uh, now we install the LEDs just to uh, verify the, just to show the inputs, uh, uh, the state of our inputs. Okay? Uh, so what do we have here? And when you switch, when, when this thing is idling, all right, it is pulled high, okay, instead of being pulled low. Then when you activate the switch uh, over here, it is being pulled low. But notice that when this is low, the LED is on in the pull down system. I'm going to post that as a lecture, post-it post lecture notes. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to just look at it and, uh, and, um, and see if it makes sense to you. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of just staring at the page to see if the things just come at you and hit your brain, okay? Uh, it's a very common practice that I have used, <laughs> all right? Um, so, <clears throat> all right. So, in, uh, so when a switch is activated, the LED is on, the input is low all right uh, and when you open the switch the led is off but the input is pulled up high uh, does it make sense to you guys here with these two scenarios or uh, is there maybe some un uncertainties about something if you have any question just speak up all right uh, all right, so now uh, when we connect this thing to the, uh, to the gate, all right, now you see I have not, uh, in, usually when you're going to see the schematic of the gates, of the logic gates, um, you are going to um, uh, have just the connections, the logic connections. You are not going to have the power drawn, but it is always assumed that the power is applied to the circuit. If you can turn off the microphones, please, so we don't have to uh, listen to the background conversations. Turn off your mics. All right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, um, so it's always assumed that the circuit is powered. So pin 14 goes to high, pin for, uh, I mean the VCC and pin seven goes to ground, all right? So in this case, if both switches are open, then both inputs are high, obviously, according to this. And of course, if you have both inputs high at the end gate, the input is, the output is going to go high, which is going to make the LED uh, turn on. Never ever connect the LED straight to ground because you're going to. This is going to draw too much current from that, and it might damage either the chip or the diode or both. Right? So uh, we always uh, usually 330 ohms are good resistors to put in series with the LED, and the purpose of that is to limit the current that this these two are going to draw. Right. In electricity, electronics, devices or the devices that are on the receiving end, when the power is applied, they do not ask for the current. They are specific, they have, they have certain resistance, they have certain impedance, and whatever they're spec for, according to the laws that apply, uh, we can't escape that, they're not going to ask for the content. They're not going to ask for the juice. They're going to try to grab that much juice as much as they need. And if it's not enough, it's going to drain, the, it's going to compromise the whole circuitry, all right? So uh, same thing here. If this thing draws too much current, it might overheat that uh, the chip 
or might actually damage the dial, right? So, um, uh, so here is the uh, difference between the pull up uh, input on the inputs system and the pull down, all right? Now, when you're going to assemble uh, the, the circuits on the labs, try to identify which one is that you're actually using, right? just for your own self. Here are the TTL logic levels that uh, are just for our own reference. We went over that already. Now, um, another thing I want to mention to you is uh, whenever it, it actually works in in, um, uh, in reality, when you when you uh, when you assemble the circuit boards on the breadboard circuits on the breadboards, uh, or whether you're going to use the multi sim, the multi sim reflects the reality. It's actually pretty darn good. Uh, you know, I was kind of skeptical. Uh, uh, at first, because I said, well, you know, you gotta have the real thing, and it's that's true. There's nothing like the like the real thing because when you ask, when when you uh, when you assemble a circuit in multi sim, it's going to be pretty close to what the reality is going to be. But still, there's nothing like assembling things really on the board. What what, what you can do uh, is use the multi sim as a tool. Uh, so you don't have to keep buying parts and experiment that you can just get the ballpark of the uh, you know, get yourself in within the ballpark of what you want to do, and then you can confirm that thing if it's uh, if it's with the, if it works with the reality and reality uh, can play some interesting tricks on you that you're going to have to overcome. So I encourage you to to go to go both ways as far as that. Uh, you know, uh, try to uh, learn how to use a sim uh, multi sim to save you some time and money. And uh, then confirm that thing in reality. Right? Okay, so uh, the LED colors versus the volt forward voltage drop. Remember last time uh, we established that uh, a silicon diode is going to have a reverse voltage uh, on the uh, right on the interface um, uh, where the P material meets the uh, uh, N material and they're going to overlap a little bit. That's called a depletion region. So whenever you have a diode in a circuit and uh, the current is going to flow that way, on the diode, there's going to be that depletion region that is going to be reverse biased. It's going to oppose the current flow with the reverse voltage in that depletion region. And with a silicon diode, it's a zero point seven or so volts, around 0 0.7 volts. If it's a germanium diode, it's about 0 0.3 volts, okay? Uh, and then there's all kinds of other values uh, because the colors that, uh, when, you, when you're talking about the uh, light emitting diodes, there are different materials being used in order to accomplish certain colors, but uh, they are still, P materials and N materials, or N and P, all right? Uh, and they're connected just like the silicon diode, but it's not silicon anymore. There's different doping uh, uh, that, that's being used for different materials because different materials, when joined together, they start emitting different colors. Now, because we're using different materials, they're going to have different depletion region, different voltages on that. So we gotta be careful with that. With that. Uh, um, the general rule is that if uh, you're assembling any of our circuits that uh, that uh, and during our labs, try to use the red LEDs. That's the, probably the surest thing uh, uh, when it when it comes. Don't get creative with different colors. Now you can you're welcome to get creative if you want if you want to experiment. Uh, with different colors uh, and if you want to experiment with the voltages and the currents and stuff like that uh, so yeah by all means but uh, when it comes to doing our labs it actually makes a difference whether you use a red led or if you use a blue led okay and if you, you know if you just want to be creative and just say ah, instead of red i'm going to use blue led because you know um, just to uh, just just to spice things up and uh, and it's, you just find out that the circuit doesn't work, okay? Because you use the wrong color of the LED, not because it's the wrong color, but it has a different forward voltage drop across the dial. Yeah? Uh, so uh, here, um, for example, right? These are the semiconductor materials. I just pulled this off Google, and if you just go light emitting diodes or LEDs, colors and uh, characteristics or voltage. Uh, uh, you're going to um, you're going to find uh, a lot of uh, information like this. So uh, the first two columns here is semiconductor material, uh, 
and then um, there is going so that's you know just for your information if you want to uh, if you want to pursue that then the wavelength the wavelength is uh, representing represents the um, uh, color of the light so this is the wavelength of the frequency of the light all right uh, usually when it comes to uh, radio frequencies or our uh, frequencies that we use for experimenting with our labs, we're going to use frequencies, all right, in hertz, okay? And, uh, and when it comes to light, uh, uh, the frequency, well, okay, so uh, certain frequencies like we go low enough in between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, that's going to be sound waves that, that are actually... Uh, we can hear as humans from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, uh, then uh, the different frequencies are going to be distinguished as different tones. Uh, I can talk low, but I can talk high. Okay, so that's, you know, eh. <clears throat> that's as far as I can go. Uh, now, uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, and of course, every frequency has a wavelength, all right? So uh, when it comes to light, uh, the, the, the different frequencies are going to be represented in the, in the, in the, in the wavelengths, okay? How, what is the wavelength to complete the whole period, okay? Before the waveform repeats. And usually there will be uh, like the light, when you talk about light and uh, when you go into fiber optics and, uh, and, and things that have to do with that, you're going to deal with the light frequencies or light colors because the audio waves, uh, you can distinguish by tones. And if you change the light frequencies, uh, there's still frequencies, but uh, some of uh, some of them we do, we re receive with our ears, some of them would receive with our eyes, and some of them we receive with our touch because uh, infrared goes down, down, down. It, it's basically a heat, so you can you don't see the heat, but you can feel the heat. All right, so we as humans we are able to sense some of those. Of course, we are not able to receive gamma rays unless you are some kind of a space guy from space all right that we don't know about mm. uh, all right so <clears throat> uh so the colors uh well, i'm not talking about pointing at the screen here uh so the colors here and then here is what we're interested in all right so uh when you connect the circuit and you get the um uh, you get the led on just get the led on it is going to have 1.2 volts if it, when it goes when it uh, is the uh, what is that magenta right uh, no red LED uh, is um, going to give you 1.8 volts of voltage drop now if you that is under one condition under the condition that minimum there's going to be 20 milliamps going through the whole circuit so if you have the voltage enough but if you have too much of a resistance in the resistor that is not going to produce enough current going through that still the led might not come on all right but when it comes on when the current flows uh then uh, the forward voltage drop is going to be 1.8 volts now when you have the led in a circuit from the top you got the led or vcc led and the resistor you crank up the vcc from five volts to 10 volts, no matter what you do, that 1.8 volts at the LED is going to stay, right? So that's the forward voltage drop. Uh, okay, so uh, now the whole current in the whole system is going to crank up and the resistor is going to take the hit. The difference between that 1.8 volts and whatever you supply, it's going to build on that resistor. So at some point, if you crank it up too high, you're gonna drive too much current through the system and you, something is going to go. Right. Uh, so then uh, here's different other different colors. Uh, the uh, what is the amber LEDs? Two volts. Uh, yellow would be two point two volts. Green. You see uh, the the difference between the red and green. Uh, it's quite significant. Now here is uh, you know uh, the blue LED. Right. It's asking for you know the white LED. It's four volts. Okay, now this is just a generic thing as a kind of a main reference. Now, sometimes you're going to go to a store and buy a certain type of LED and maybe some manufacturer or some company has established some diff combining different materials to get that uh, same color or similar color. It might, uh, it might be different. So whenever you're designing circuit, 
uh, make sure you confirm whatever you buy, like into using that circuit, confirm that. So how do you confirm it? Well, stick it in the breadboard, apply some voltage and measure, you know, make it make this, this thing come on uh, and measure the voltage across just to make sure what the voltage drop across the dial is actually with this particular device. You know? Uh, now, when you uh, when you switch the multimeter, uh, just a reminder: when you switch the multimeter in um, uh, onto the diode setting, right? sometimes it's combined with the continuity setting. So when you touch those leads, it's going to make a beep sound. It's uh, also quite often is combined with the LED tester function. When you uh, when you uh, uh, forward bias the voltage, the diode. Right? Uh, and the diode comes on, you're going to see some sort of a number on the um, on the display. And uh, it's not a meaningless number. That number should be, right? Emphasis on the word should. That number should be the forward voltage bias that is on this uh, on this on this um, uh, in this table. However, sometimes it's going to give you a false reading because different multimeters work in a different way. And I noticed that it kind of works with the yellow, red, and green LEDs, depending on the multimeter. But when it comes to blue and white, it is going to give you a different number and it might not light the um, LED up, okay? It's because when you switch that, the continuity meter or the diode test uh, uh, tester, uh, the meter is actually supplying a tiny bit of a voltage uh, on the on the output leads. How much voltage? You can check it very easily. You get two multimeters, set one to voltmeter, set one to the uh, continue to continuity tester or, or LED tester, and just uh, connect red LED, red lead to red lead and black to black. And that voltmeter is going to measure the voltage. You can experiment that with your friends when you have nothing to do, when you're bored. Okay? So um, um, now here, the last uh, slide. This is the last slide for this one here. Is this. Uh, what do we have here? We have a red LED and we have a blue LED going on here. All right? And the switch is closed and the resistor is 330 ohms. Okay. Um, All right, right. Okay, so on this here, on this picture, what do we have here? We have the VCC and so that's the red. Now here's a blue LED, okay? When we close the switch, the LED, uh, the red LED lit up, okay? But the blue one didn't. Okay, and both are identical, all right? So the multimeter shows uh, whatever, 3.2 volts across the resistor, and it shows 1.778, so 1.8 volts uh, on the LED. And uh, if we look at uh, that 1.8 volts across the red, uh, well, look, 1.8, 1, 1. so it's pretty close to 1.8. See, that, that multimeter measured one point, almost 1. 1.8 volts here. Okay? Now, uh, when we go uh, to this thing here, uh, this is measuring three point, the switch is closed, okay? The bottom one is measuring the, oh, across the resistor. It still have a little bit of current flowing. Uh, so the bottom, uh, across the resistor, we have 1.7 volts. Uh, when well, the VCC is five, and across the the LED here we have something is like three point three four one. Let's take a look at the blue LED. The blue LED uh, wants to produce. It needs about three point six volts across that to make it on three point six, and this one has three point three. So that's why it didn't come on, all right? So when I go to the last picture here and it says, what was adjusted to turn the blue LED on? Okay, uh, because now it's on. See, here's 330 degree, uh, degrees, uh, ohms on that one. And that's enough to make the uh, red LED to come on. And I had to go down with the values. I just kept going down, kept going down, kept changing the values until I want to get 228. Well, there's no, 228 ohm resistor 
uh, available on the market, maybe special order. Um, but in the multi-sim, I was able to adjust the values and I found out, okay, when I go to 300, sorry, 228, then the resistance is lower, low enough to have more current flow. And that gave us enough current to, uh, to flow here. And this uh, voltage right here across the resistor uh, is 1.6 and then we get 3.368 uh, which is uh, which is which is uh, what it should be within 3.36 still we got about well, 3.36 but we have enough current so that one didn't give us enough current this one here uh, whatever the specs were set up in the multi-sim that gave us enough uh, to that uh, enough to make it light up so that's that's why it is important to uh, to to make sure that uh, you use the right color LED with our um, uh, with our circuits. Yeah. Right? So that's why. It's, sorry. So if we don't have a two twenty eight resistor, would we go lower? Just fine. Uh, just get the next uh, available that you have within your stash. Yeah. All right. Uh, so lower could be, or you can really, if you really want to get to the exact one, you can probably combine series and parallel a bunch of resistors and make one like that, right? But I just uh, demonstrated that I had to lower it to 228. So maybe, uh, maybe uh, if you have 220, all right, then you should be fine. You know, 180, try it, okay? And then, uh, then uh, you can calculate the current that's going through that and compare to the specifications of the diode, see if that current is okay to, for that LED to handle, right? All right, so now let's uh, let's take a quick look at uh, some of the um, um, yeah okay so um, week nine all right here timing graphs propagation delay switch bounce Schmidt triggered inputs okay so if you take a look at this uh, slide here this is the OR gate okay so of course OR gate uh, A or B has to be on for the output to be on now we can represent this thing graphically so let's say this here is the A input all right and this graph here this form represents the B input, and over here is the output. What can we uh, what can we see between time zero and time one? Because sometimes you get the you know, circuits going on and the pulses or the inputs times on and off they can be timed. Okay, so between the time zero, that's why it's called timing graph. Right. Now let me read this thing. Timing graph describes the logic status of an output based on its logic status against time. Right. All right. <clears throat> so between time zero and time one, what do we have in this region? We have B low and we have A low. Well, B low and A low, that's going to give us zero. Is the output zero? Oh yeah, look at that. The output is on zero, it's not one, okay? Now between time one and time two, the A goes up and the B stays low. But in, so in this region right here, in this, uh, uh, in this inter, during this time interval between T1 and T2, we have one of the inputs on, which is the A, right? So A is on, B is on, okay, we got one. So during that one, oh look, the output went high, all right? Now, in between time two and time three, we have both inputs high. Well, if we have both inputs high, so this thing still should be high, is it? Yes, okay, good. Now, during between three and four, one of the inputs went low and the other one stayed high. So as long as one of them is high with the OR gate, the input output still should be high. Now look at, this here it is it's still going on so those inputs are changing depending on whatever it is but as long at, at all times between here and here one of them is always on so that means the output stayed high now only when we have both inputs low then the output goes low which is here and here Take a look at this thing when you download this thing. Uh, give me a few minutes after this class. Uh, I'm going to uh, upload everything here that, that you need. Now, now when it comes to end gate here, 
the time graph is going to be different according to the truth table, right? So what do we have here? Uh, the regions that are marked here is that when the output goes high, then when the output goes high, both our inputs have to be high. And in this case, uh, here output is high. This is the only time that the, this and that, these are the only two times that the, both inputs go high. So that it's going to produce a high output. You know, not a very um, complicated thing to understand. It's just uh, when, when we do a truth table is that when we connect and flip the dip switches on the breadboard, that's nice. But some quite often what's going to happen is that uh, there's going to be time um, alignment involved. So that's why we are going to use those time graphs. Okay? All right. Now, what do we have here? Ideal. Okay. So that's as far as the time graphs. Okay. Now, uh, ideally on paper, uh, this should be all nice and beautiful. Okay. So uh, the, now you see, this is not VCC, this is VDD. Sometimes you're going to see VDD. That means uh, the FET circuitry is being uh, used. So it's just a side note, okay? Uh, I encourage you to research what is the difference between VCC and VDD and why, all right? Anyways, uh, so what do we have here? Normally, ideally, the transition between high and low or low and high, it should be instantly, okay? But that's the ideal world. It never happens like that, okay? Now, to our human eye, it might be happening just like that instantly. But in reality, if you magnify the time graph, you're going to see some interesting things uh, happening there, okay? So uh, uh, when you have the time in, uh, if, you, if you magnify, you stretch the time, it takes a little bit, it always takes a little bit of time to, for, this, for the transition to happen, right? And that is called a propagation delay, all right? The time that it takes for, the, uh, for whatever it is, it could be the input, but what well, input doesn't uh, uh, switch, the output switches. Uh, so when the output switches from low, high to low or goes from low to high, it is never like this. It's always going to be, it's going to very little time, all right? Milliseconds, nanoseconds, but it's going to be still a bit. So that time between here, between, uh, between uh, before it reaches down, and we're talking 90% here, 90% here. Uh, uh, then uh, we're going to uh, call that thing as a propagation delay, okay? Now, when you add a bunch of um, uh, gates in series, those, and you have a bunch of circuitry, uh, one follow the other, one follow the other, one follow the other, at some point, the propagation delay is going to build up so much that it might cause a timing problem, um, um, with uh, uh, you know, with some circuitry, the best example of a propagation delay is uh, when you have a sound system. Okay, and uh, if you have a uh, microphone at the front, and let's say you are standing a uh, hundred feet from that person who is speaking. Okay, so at a hundred feet, you should still hear that person talking. If you turn the sound system off, you should still hear that person speaking. Okay, so there's going to be a little bit of time uh, that the sound is going to take from that person's mouth to your ear. Okay, and the sound uh, approximately travels thousand feet per second. So you can do the calculation. Okay. Now, if you turn the sound system on, and if you uh, have the microphone, preamp, mixer, whatever, the amplifier, and you have a speaker that is right in front of you. Okay. Now, the electricity, the electric circuits are going to be much faster than the actual sound physically traveling through the air. So you're going to hear the sound from the speaker first, and then it's going to hit you with a delay, the sound that's coming from the speaker's mouth. So that's the propagation delay. And that's going to cause a little bit of a problem because if you, you have to listen to this thing for a long time, it's going to be annoying. That's why uh, the, the speakers uh, quite often are on time delays. So that speaker is being slowed down. So it gives the chance for the sound waves to reach and then they hit the boat at the same time. Uh, makes a huge difference, okay? So that's just kind of a... Mm, uh, sort of example of why it might be a problem. In electronic circuitry, 
that might be a problem when the signals have to reach at the same time and something has to be sensing something and something is going through a bunch of circuitry and the other thing is not. And uh, so sometimes you have to do one, slow the other one down so you could have the proper synchronization of those two inputs, okay? So that's why the propagation delay could be a problem, okay? Uh, propagation delays, so the de delayed, uh, okay, so here's the um, uh, uh, terminology here. Time, de uh, time propagation delay, so propagation delay for the time to go from high to low, and the propagation delay that goes from the propagation time uh, so that goes from low to high. Uh, take a look at the data sheets of the any logic gates and try to find those, all right? And you're going to find some interesting things. They might ask some questions, all right? Uh, so that, okay. Um, what does it say here? Uh, the propagation delay, what's a propagation delay? When the gate inputs change, Outputs don't change instantaneously. This delay is known as gate or a propagation delay, all right? Propagation, propagation delay is uh, uh, gating. Yes, it's being used, but gating sometimes can be confused with the uh, sound system setup. And uh, if there are some musicians, uh, they're not talking about, if you don't, you just uh, talk to me sometime and I'll explain it to you. Uh, but uh, gate or propagation delay, that's the thing. That's the time that takes for this thing to switch from high to low or from low to, from low to high. Now, so that's, we took care of the propagation delay. Now, but I'm gonna, just going to, um, uh, so we're talking about the disadvantages. Disadvantages, disadvantages of the, because it could be a disadvantage that you have to overcome or you have to compensate for it. Right? Now, uh, what, uh, what I am going to ask you, and I'm going to show it next time we see each other, but I'm going to encourage you to do some self-learning um, because that's never going to end. I know you have done it a little bit, uh, but uh, trust me, it's, it, I, I'm doing a good thing for you. Try to see if the propagation delay can be used to an advantage, All right? So here's the thing. How can you use a propagation delay to create a pulse? Right. So here's the question I'm posing. Try to research that. How can you use a propagation delay in order to create a pulse? A pulse. Right. All right. Okay. Switch bouncing. Um, switch bouncing. Right. It does have to do with the mechanical switches. Every time you switch a switch on, there is a spring-loaded material, some sort of a metal hitting on metal. And, you know, to us, it might seem like, yeah, it's made a contact. But if you look at the slow, like a magnified in a slow motion, slow motion camera, uh, you're going to see that, uh, if I'm just going to do it in a slow motion here for you, I'm going to close, pretending that this is a switch that's closing here. And then close in slow motion is going to go, Eh, 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 eh. it's going to settle, all right? It's happening very fast. However, it is slow enough for the fast receiving circuitry to actually detect that. And when you, when you flip a switch and it just bounces like that before it closes, then it could be considered as a bunch of signals. And that's not what we want, because when we want to apply a signal to a certain input of a certain gate or certain whatever it is, we want to have a firm input. We have to have that clear on and clear off. So we just want to have a bang, close, open, all right? So same thing. So, so switch bouncing is a problem. And that's what it looks like at uh, when it's uh, magnified, I think. Now, do you guys have a class uh, after this? Do you, are, you, are you rushing to another class? Yeah, we have a class in five minutes. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to continue. And uh, as just like the last time, I'm, uh, I'm going to post that. And uh, if, uh, if you need to go, by all means, go. And uh, you're going to come back, uh, hit that playlist that I posted. And this video is going to be on within probably 20 minutes after I'm done with it. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay. But I just, I just want you, I just want you to, uh, to know what you need to know. 
Uh, cool. So I'll see you. Just when for I see a reference. You. Sorry. How much? Would, just for like a reference, just so I know, how much more do you have left to go? Like half hours worth, forty-five minutes worth. Oh, I could go on for two more hours, <laughs> right? Okay. But but uh, but uh, this thing is probably going to be maybe 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to continue talking to myself probably, and uh, um, you're going to watch it later. Right. Cool. All right. So switch bouncing yeah, here. Sorry to interrupt. I have a question. Uh huh. Is it possible when uploading the video? The video? No. Sorry? Yes, sir. If uploading the video, is it possible to upload it in 720 for like HD? Um, this one here, when I get zoom, it doesn't go HD. If I go, if I look, if I record this thing locally using the OBS studio, then it's going to be in HD. But uh, uh, here's the thing with the zoom. Uh, the more people log in, then the bandwidth is watered down. I see. So, so the quality goes down a little bit. That's that's the zoom thing. All right, sir. Thank you. Okay. Bye. All right. See you. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, now, um, uh, switch bouncing. Okay, switch bouncing is another real world problem. Okay, this is basically what I say. Uh, and it's, it, it says here, you think you did it once, but MCU takes it as several times. So basically, hello. What I say, hello. Hello, sir. I have one question related to my lab. One, two, three. Uh -huh. uh, I want to tell you, I have uploaded my one, two, three lab in a F4 submission, but okay. I didn't get to Mars. So what should I do now? Oh, you have done, uh, have you submitted that? Yes, I have already submitted. Okay, I'm just going to, uh, later on, I'm going to mark it. Don't worry about it. Okay, if you, if thank you, you. No problem. If you submit it, I mark it. Yes, yes, okay, thank you. I have already submitted one, two, three, three. Okay. okay, okay, guys. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, characteristic of, uh, what does it say, characteristics of a switch uh, bounce. Uh, nearly all switches do it. So some are better, some are uh, not as good. Uh, the duration of a bouncing uh, and the time that it settles, it, it varies, right? But usually some of the good switches offer you the time, almost can guarantee about five milliseconds of settling down. So that's, uh, you know, 5,000 uh, 5, of a second, okay? Uh, switches uh, of exactly the same time bounce differently, of course, because you know there's no two objects in the world that are the same. Although some are kind of, some come pretty close, all right. Uh, so bounce uh, the bounce differs depending on the user's force uh, and the speed. So the so, okay, it also depends on how you know, the user's hand. Uh, a typical switch makes a multiple transition times during the tens of milliseconds all right um yeah all right so that's uh, that's what that slide is now that's the, the bouncing problem is not only a switch i'm, I'm going to uh, uh, uh i'm going to tell you a little bit of a situation that i had years ago and it had something to do with a digital piece of equipment that has uh, well, analog power supply. Pretty much everything has a power supply and equipment built in. Uh, it was a um, it was a light uh, dimmer pack uh, for the theatrical lighting. Uh, I'm not sure what the power, but it was powerful light uh, dimmer pack. It was huge, and uh, it had some huge outputs that drive all power. And then they had the control so that the control could be tapped in with the controller uh, board. So you could make the lights uh, dim or go on or off at different times, uh, depending on the control unit. The problem was that the whole thing was just going nuts. As soon as you plugged it in, the lights were going just like disco lights and you couldn't stop that, right? So um, I tried many different things. Uh, uh, I pulled the whole thing apart. Um, and uh, first of all, I looked at some kind of a uh, some that's called cold soldering joint uh, or worn out soldering joint that maybe something uh, something was not uh, not making a proper connection and it was just maybe uh, sparking uh, at some board. I uh, couldn't find anything. 
uh, still this light going nuts. Uh, there, there was no sign of thermal runaway and thermal runaway is basically if uh, one of the circuits or the parts elements uh, is um, going down, is getting damaged. And as it heats up, the temperature makes it um, uh, acting up even more, right? So usually when that happens, when you see, you just spray a little bit of a freezy on that. And you can see when the noises stop or something settles, and then you can pinpoint the area maybe. So that's, no, there was no sign of that, uh, but still um, uh, there, those, there was no way to control the lights. This thing was just going nuts and there was no way to settle it down. I almost gave up on it because I I tried this this that and the other thing. And there's one last thing that I tried, and it's a you know it's a one common technique in a, an electronic bench. If you can do it, disassemble the whole thing or take it apart, make everything connecting connected, and plug it in and make it work. And of course, the problem is going to continue, but that's when you're looking for intermittent connection. Okay, put it on your bench. Turn all the lights off, make it complete dark that you can see the hand in front of your face, and then you bang the table. Right? That vibration is, if there is an intermittent connection, that vibration is going to cause a tiny little bit of a spark, and you have to look for it. Yes, I saw the spark. All right, well, look at this thing. Turn the light on. It was a fuse holder for the power supply. So the fuse holder, those uh, those little clamps that were holding the fuse were not tight enough. So the fuse was just sitting there and that was creating enough sparking, all right? So those sparks were mistaken by the data signals and that uh, uh, the data was, um, um, the, the digital circuitry was uh, confused of what um, what that uh, what the signal is supposed to be, and that's why the, all the lights were acting up as disco lights, right? So here, needle nose pliers, close the fuse holder enough, put the fuse in, the whole thing was off. Okay, so uh, so that's uh, the you know there's spikes or wrong um, wrong signal. I mean sp spikes or bounces can make a huge difference in actually making the digital circuitry not work, all right? Uh, so, um, so there's a problem and with the switches, so we got to overcome that, all right? Now, I am going to, um, uh, I'm going to, in the, in the description below, okay? uh, there are a couple of uh, YouTube videos that I'm going to uh, send to you for you to watch. Uh, one is uh, one minute long, the other one was like a one and a half long, and the third one is a little bit longer, but uh, I'm just going to tell you to watch just a minute and 23 seconds of that, okay? Uh, that is going to explain uh, the things about the, uh, the Schmidt triggers, the um, switch bouncing, and uh, the reasoning uh, behind all that, okay? And next time we meet, we're going to take first couple minutes to discuss uh, what we have seen, just so we can retain the information, all right? Okay, so I will see you when I see you guys and uh, have a wonderful rest of the weeks. How much, how much longer did I take? Five minutes. Okay, guys, uh, so yeah, uh, we'll just like, take on that uh, Schmidt trigger later on with this, but when you see the videos, uh, you're going to see um, uh, you see what I mean. And next time we we'll see, of course, as I said, we're going to discuss that a little bit. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, see you next time.